Dear Father, thank you for this last uh, preview of the lesson for the quarter on Job. It has so much to tell us, uh, particularly on your redemption plan. So we pray that you will open our minds and make us understand your grace. And may we have a better appreciation of the gospel, especially this Christmas Eve, knowing that you came down in the person of Jesus Christ to be with us so that God can be with us. And through the gospel, we can be with you. Uh, make us teachable and make us humble. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, like I said, this will be the 14th lesson of the quarter, which is extraordinary. We don't uh, have 14 Sabbaths per quarter. It takes a while to cycle. It's because when we leap year, we have 14 Sabbaths. But it's good because this lesson is entitled what? Oh, I gave it away. It's right there. <laughs> Some lessons from the book of Job. So it's, it's fitting to end the quarter with lessons from the book of Job. And... Uh, the reason why it's fitting is we don't want to leave a quarter without gleaning the important facets of Bible applications that have been covered in. Okay? Um, I will cover some things in review and uh, more things which is new so we can glean what God wants us to know from the book of Job. I think uh, the gospel is so, so clear in the book of Job if only we're only willing to understand. Okay, so we, let's proceed. Uh, remember the outline. What's the outline of the book of Job? Uh, it's a poetry. It's poetry. It's a big poem, okay? Which is sandwiched by two narratives. The first narrative is the prologue. The prologue, which is the introduction to the book. And then the second narrative is the epilogue. Those are like uh, a few chapters. And all the chapters in between are in poetic form. It's in, in, in the genre is poetry. And that's the, those are the cycles of speeches between Job's friends and Job. Uh, those were dialogues which were followed by monologues from Elihu. And then God talks and Job answers and they were conversing in the end. Okay? Let's remember uh, the, the underpinning of the study of the book of Job because this gives us a view of the great controversy. There are two, at least two types of God's will. God, there is a perfect will of God, which is based on His pleasure. There is the permissive will of God, which is based on man's desire. When we say the perfect will of God, that's the will that He decrees, that He demands. Regardless of what we think, that's the decree and the demand of God. And most of the time, what He decrees, we cannot do anything about because He's, he's sovereign. Now, the permissive will of God is what He condones because men responds and decides otherwise they might not agree with what he demands so he condones it and most of the time if they really rebel he condemns what man does so if we were to go get the venn diagram that's in the mathematical form god's pleasure is on the left men's desires on the right the righteous plans of god you will see that because of man's choice evil happens and god permits evil okay but based on God's pleasure, everything is good. Okay, but based on men's decision and men's choice, there are a lot of good that never happens. If we only dis uh, jive with what God thought and His desires, all the good will happen. But that's, uh, that's, more, uh, that's unrealistic because of our sinful nature. So there's a lot of good that never happens. There's evil that happens that God permits. And then the intersection of both right there is the good that happens. Despite the fact that we're sinful, we still decide to go on God's side and there's good that happens. And because of this background, we understand the conversation between God and Satan. And remember, Job is based on a triangle. Okay? Do not forget this. Without this triangle in mind, you cannot understand the book of Job. What are the elements of the triangle? Remember, you got God's justice, the retribution principle which says man prospers when he obeys, man suffers when he disobeys, and then we have Job's righteousness, and we'll cover that as we move forward. What is the retribution principle? You have a good God, you do good works, you will have a good life, which is normally what we call the prosperity gospel. You got a good God, you add bad works, you will have a bad life. This is retribution theology. So the retribution principle hangs on two theologies. First is 
prosperity gospel or prosperity theology. The other is retribution theology. Both of these are not the will and the desire of God. We will soon find out. All right. So I coined a term which will be, make, help us understand what Job is trying to teach us. Um, the enemy claims that there's bribery between God and man and man and God. This is divine bribery. How does the enemy say it? Does God bless? If God blesses, men worship. Yes, okay? That's the flow chart. If God does not bless, men will curse God. That's what Satan says, okay? Now, from the standpoint of man, does man worship? If he worships, God blesses him. If man does not worship, God does not bless him. God curses him. This is the retribution principle. But all I'm saying, if you look at it, it's nothing more than bribery. Either God bribes men or men bribes God. And this is the contention of the enemy. He says, the game plan of God, the policy of God is to bribe men and have men bribe God. And Job has been written to falsify this claim. Okay? Uh, I'd like you to look at this because we'll, this will be repeated several times. But this is the way it flows. Okay? From the standpoint of God, if God blesses, the next question is, is he worthy? If he's worthy, will you worship him? If the answer is yes, there are two ways to worship God. You worship him because he is a paying God. That's the meaning of a paying God. You worship him because God pays you. Because you do something, you worship him, then you get something in return from God. The other kind of worship is a recognition that it is God who provides, a sovereign God who provides. Now, the other possibility is, even if God blesses you, you will not worship Him. The answer is no. What happens when you say no? You either exploit God, He is a, a divine lackey, okay, a divine butler, or it is a deposed God. He's not there. You find other idols in your life. Okay? So those are a possibility. Now, if the answer to the question, does God bless? If the answer is no, the question is, is God worthy? If God is worthy, do you worship Him? If you worship Him, even if He doesn't bless you, it is a recognition that He is an all-wise God. There's another possibility. You can worship Him even if He doesn't bless you because despite the fact that He is distant, I cannot reach Him, He is still God. Okay? This is almost like uh, masochistic. Uh, this is what we call ascetism. What's the teaching of Buddhism? Buddhism is atheist. Buddhism doesn't believe in God. But what's the teaching of, of, of Buddhism? In order for you to find peace and fulfillment in life, you must eliminate all desires. And by, by eliminating all your desires, since you don't desire anymore, you will have no disappointments. Okay? That's, that's ascetism. And that's what happens in the end. Now, the other possibility is, he doesn't bless me. Do I worship him? No, because he doesn't bless me. So what are the possibilities there? If you do not worship him because he doesn't bless you, you think of an uncaring God or you think of a vindictive God. God doesn't care. That's why he doesn't bless me. The, thing, the other thing is, oh, just because I made a little mistake, you're very vindictive and now you curse me? All right, so we'll go turn around and look at the perspective of man. This is the same thing. and We just reversed it. Um, is God blessing you? Is, are you a God-blessed individual? If yes, yes, men will benefit. Because men benefits, does he worship? If he worship, he can say, I worship because I did something for God. He earned, he earned that prosperity. Or the possibility is, I only receive it from God and everything is from grace. So I'm a recipient of grace. Okay? If you do not worship, you're a freeloader. What's the meaning of a freeloader? You just get something without giving anything in return, okay? And the other possibility is, God blesses me, I don't care. I will worship my own idols. Remember, we got all our own idols. Anything that's more important to you than God, okay? Now, if the answer is no, man will be deprived. He doesn't have benefits. Then the question is, if you're deprived, do you still worship? If you worship, even if you're deprived, you can submit miserably. That's ascetic and masochistic. You basically say, I, I will just bear it, okay, and claw my way into this relationship with God, even if it doesn't bless me. <laughs> because, because it doesn't bless me, I have no choice because He's still God. So I'm miserable and suffer. On the other hand, you can surrender joyfully. That's why you read in Peter, even if they were being killed in the name of Jesus, they, they had joy, inexpressible joy, all right? 
Now, if you say no, because God didn't bless me, I will not worship him. There are two possibilities that you, Marino, pa, si Adrian. Popo yung si Adrian. Okay. Uh, the, the, the possibility is, because you didn't blame me, I'm, I'm suffering, I will blame God. Okay? I, either I blame God or I disbelieve him. There is no God at all. Okay? These are the possibilities of the circumvention of the uh, retribution principle. Of course, what we are attempting to do is basically go and say, surrender joyfully. That's the lesson in Job. But we will go to that in a little while. Okay? I review, let's review this. This is one of my favorite stories. Remember, Versinjetorex. Versinjetorex Torex was the, the commander of the Gauls, the general of the Gauls. This is one of the barbaric tribes, one of the last barbaric tribes that were defeated by the Romans. Julius Caesar defeated the Gauls. And how did he defeat the Gauls? The Gauls had a fortress. And what Julius Caesar did was he surrounded the Gauls and created a fortress around the fortress of the Gauls. What does that mean? They cannot go out of their fortress. Okay? The bottom line is because they cannot go out of the fortress, they're locked there. And whatever supplies they have, they will run out and they will die unless they surrender to the Romans. The bottom line is when the, the Gauls were about to die, Vercingetorix rode and mounted his horse, went out of the fortress, and then proceeded directly to Caesar. He dismounted his horse and laid prostrate on the ground with his sword, and then begged Julius Caesar, what did he say? I give you my own life so that you might let my men live. If my men die, there will be nothing left of the Gauls, no one left to worship our gods. What was he concerned about? He was not concerned about his life or the life of his men. He is concerned about goals remaining so that there will be worshippers of the God of the goals. What does this say? Even the barbarians have this inclination and instinct to worship because men were made to worship, right? So we come to grips with a, a very famous statement in the spirit of prophecy found in the patriarchs and prophets. It says, The plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of men. It was not for this alone that Christ came to earth, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. True enough, during Christmas, we remember Emmanuel, God is with us. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. But really, what's the purpose of Christmas and what's the purpose of the cross? The purpose of Christmas, the purpose of the cross, is to bring glory to God in the highest because of what God has done in Jesus Christ. The purpose is worship. So here's the point. Uh, how do I set this up? Uh, a lot of people claim that several Seventh-day Adventists believe in salvation by works, right? I'll, I'll paint to you a picture why it appears that a lot of Adventists believe in salvation by works. Because for a typical Seventh-day Adventist, what is salvation? You have an idea? No. Yeah, the typical. That, that you already studied, uh, uh, Benji. The typical belief of an Adventist is salvation is to be in heaven when Jesus comes back. Second Advent, right? So the focus of salvation for a typical Adventist is the second Advent. Right? So when you say you want to be saved, if you want to be saved, you really actually mean, will you go to heaven when Jesus comes back? That's the question. So what's the, question, what, what's the common answer of people? Well, you got to get ready. When you got to get ready, you got to be ready for Jesus to come. You must make sure that your election is sure. Okay? Make your election sure. Say, Peter, to us. And because of that, there is a, a call to holy living. And people, a Seventh-day Adventist, think that if you go into holy living and prepare for the second advent of Jesus Christ, then you will be saved. And people call it salvation by works. I think it's misunderstood. What's the problem? The focus of salvation is the second advent of Jesus Christ, not the cross of Jesus Christ. When you are asked as a believer in Jesus if you are saved and you think of salvation in terms of the cross, then the answer will tell you, I cannot save by works. Nothing that I do can save me. Well, what happens? Only what God has done in Jesus Christ can save me. So this is my explanation. The reason why there is a confusion among Adventists today is most Adventists look at salvation in terms of the second coming. But if Adventists uh, start looking at salvation in terms of the first coming of the first Advent of Jesus Christ, they will know that they cannot be saved by works. They are only saved by faith. Okay? So this is what happens. A lot of our evangelical brothers and sisters, those are non Non-Adventist preachers and non-Adventist Bible teachers 
What's the center? The center is the gospel. And what's the purpose of the gospel? The purpose of the gospel is the salvation of sinners. The ultimate goal of the gospel is to save men from sin. Uh, I don't have to go. You listen to Greg Laurie. You, you listen to, uh, to Franklin Graham. Listen to the evangelists all over the Christian TV today and all over the world. Their clamor is for people to be saved from sin to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Nothing wrong with that. But what we're saying is there's something deeper than just the salvation of men. I hope you're following me because this is what Job is trying to say. What are we saying? The gospel is still the center, but really the ultimate aim of the gospel is not just the salvation of men, but the justification of whom? The justification of God or the glory of God. So if men do not come to worship God, truthfully worship Him, evangelism shall have failed. I hope you follow me. This is very important to grasp. Evangelism is not just trying to get people into the kingdom, get people to be saved. Evangelism is trying to lift up the glory of God as it is displayed in what He has done in Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, and a lot of people ask me, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Because you're not saved by Adventism or... The, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why I choose to be part of this fellowship in this movement is because our perspective in evangelism is not just the salvation of men. Our perspective is the glory and the worship of God. That's why it's called the Great Controversy. Who wins in the Great Controversy? Jesus wins. Who gets all the glory? Jesus does. What does the Bible say? Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What's the ultimate goal? It is not centered on men. It is centered on God, centered on Jesus Christ. If we only realize that, maybe our evangelism and our approach to outreach will change. It will make a big difference in the world. All right, so let's just review some biblical texts to support that. Remember in John 12, when the Greeks were looking for Jesus, Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. This is John 12. He's saying, the Son of Man is about to be glorified. What hour is he talking about? The hour has come. What hour is this? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. And there's a purpose why he came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. Please do not forget John 12, 27 to 28 and 33. There is one purpose he came for this hour. What is that hour? That hour is his death on the cross. What is the purpose of the cross? It's very clear in John 12 that it was to bring glory to God not just the salvation of man. Men will still be saved by the cross, but the ultimate goal of the cross is to bring glory to the Father and glory to the Son. And what did Jesus say? Father, glorify your name. Then the voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Where is the confirmation of Paul? Paul confirms what Jesus said in Ephesians, one of the most glorious, they say the mother of all the epistles in terms of grandeur. What did uh, Paul say? He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world to the praise of the glory of His grace which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Jesus Christ, He freely bestowed what? The grace. The grace, okay, that will save us. When did He conceive of this? Before the foundation of the world, we were already chosen to be saved in Jesus Christ. For what purpose? For the grace, for the praise and glory of God. Okay, so all, everything hangs and falls. The praise and glory of God. Why do I say this? Because the book of Job is about the great controversy. Let me put this this way. A lot of people study Revelation and Daniel. They try to derive the issues of, of the great controversy in terms of what Daniel and Revelation says. You will not find explicit references to the issues of the great controversy in Daniel and Revelation. But you will find explicit issues outlined in the book of Job when it comes to the conflict between Jesus and Christ. Right? What is the, what is the accusation of Satan? How many of you have heard this? The accusation of Satan is that men cannot obey the law. You don't find that in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, but that is not, it's not that they say anything about the law, right? Oh, the, oh, the, the issue of the great controversy is oh, the, the real day of worship. Uh, that's not the issue. What's the issue? The issue in the great controversy is worship. You understand, right? Because the purpose of the cross and the purpose since time immemorial is worship. So the purpose in the great controversy is to figure out what is true worship and what is false worship. What is the contention in the book of Job? The contention in the book of Job, I want to emphasize this, is that worship is about bribery. 
Worship is not possible unless God bribes you or you bribe God. That's the claim of the enemy. What's the claim of God? You are wrong because worship is possible because of who I am. I don't have to bribe anybody, neither does anybody need to bribe me. I am God and I alone is worthy of your worship. That's why it's worship. That's the whole issue. And whilst you study the book of Job, God will embark into proving to you exactly why he is worthy of worship. Okay, that's why it's very fascinating. So here, here's the beginning of Job. Okay, Job, Job 1.8. God says, have you considered my servant Job? He's a righteous man. He is a blameless man. You've read that and you studied it this morning, right? And then what did Satan say? What did, what, how did he respond? Oh, he only loves you because you bless him. Let me take away and he won't any more. I will take away everything and he will not bless you anymore. He only worships you because you bribe him. And worship is about bribery. What did God say? Go ahead and do it. He wasn't betting with Satan. Okay, yeah, well, I'm going to make sure. I let, I let the Bible teacher say there was a bet between God and Satan. There was no bet. All he's saying, God is saying, hey, have you seen Job? And then Satan, yeah, yeah, you, you, you're that, that Job that you're proud about? He only worships you because you bless him. Question, did Job worship God because God blessed him? People who studied Job with preconceived ideas will answer no. No, you will understand in the first several chapters of Job that Job was very selfish. He worshipped God so that he can get something from him. Okay? So what was God basically saying? Okay, you want to start this, this experiment? He says, says, says God to Satan, go ahead and do it. And I'm telling you, I will determine the outcome. And you know what the outcome will be? Satan will not talk anymore. Right? He doesn't talk in the end. What will God say? I'm telling you, I can be worshipped for who I am. I don't have to be bribed. I don't have to bribe you in order for you to worship me. Let's proceed. So these are the five lessons from the book of Job relating to the book of Job. I don't, I don't know how you can incorporate that in your classes. Five, we have about five minutes each. <laughs> Intro and conclusion. Uh, um, most of these are taken from the book of Sky Jitani entitled With. I kind of modified some, make it five, he had only four. These are, these are five prepositions. How do we relate to God? The book of Job tells us that there are five ways to relate to God. You can relate to God from God, which I call consumerism. You can relate to God being under God, which is moralism. You can be over God, which is formalism. You will be for God, which is activism. And you can be with God, which is Christian hedonism. That's why I have a lot of slides in order to prove this to you. Let's go hit it one at a time. This is the book of Sky Jatani. It's not that expensive. If you can order this, a Kindle edition, and you buy it, that the book is simply entitled With. It, is, it will be worth your while to get this. I subscribe to Sky's devotionals every day. One of my subscriptions for daily devotionals. And you know what he calls his devotional? With God daily. His devotional is being with God daily. Okay. So here is the issue in his book. There are several ways to relate to God. You can be from God. You can be under God. You can be for God. You can be over God. But really the best way to relate to God is to be with God. Okay. Let's process this one at a time. 2 Timothy 3, 1-4. In the last days, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Why? Because people believe God and relate themselves to God so that he can, they, they can just get something from Him. Let's see what Job has to say about this. Job 1, 10-11. You have blessed the work of His hands and His possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Why was Job following God? According to Satan, because God was blessing him. And very soon, Job's going to prove he's doing that exactly so that God can do him some favors. Okay? So, the first wrong, the first wrong relationship with God is from God. What does, how, does, how do we describe this? What is the center of this relationship? If you're related to God from God, you are the center of this relationship. Your work, your play, your goals, church, God and others is centered on you. Because you're related to God and you look at God that things come from God. I always say this in one of my favorite uh, slides. He who dies with the most toys wins, says Malcolm Forbes. And the pastor corrected this. What did the pastor say? 
he who dies with the most toys still dies. Right? And when you die, you're going to take it with you. Uh, Lily Tomlin, <laughs> one of the theologians, <laughs> the movie star, said, the problem with winning the rat race is when you win, you're still a rat. Okay, so that's a problem. If you treat God as a merchandise and a commodity, whichever way you do it, you'll be a rat. Okay, here's the problem we have commodified God. You can turn it into a cross, but prosperity gospel and the retribution principle is still about money. That's why, that's what, what did Jesus say? You cannot serve God and money, God and mammon. Uh, in fact, one of the biggest idols today is God. In fact, what does the, the, the dollar bill and the dollar coin say? In God we trust. Who is that God? Most of the time, it's the paper bill and the coin that becomes God. Okay? Uh, remember, what's the mean, meaning of commodification of God? We have turned God into a commodity. He is only valuable because of what we can gain from Him. The prosperity gospel is also clear. What happens? You open your Bible, money is going to fall. And you will be healed of your diseases. So here, I'll go back to that outline. You will see that. And I highlighted what's from God. From God is exploiting God. And really, if you relate to God as, an, as from God, in that uh, particular paradigm, if God blesses you, oh, I will exploit him some more. If he does not bless me, oh, he doesn't care. Okay. Now, from the standpoint of man, uh, if God blesses you, you just free load. As long as God blesses me, I will follow Him. Okay. If He does not bless me, I will begin to blame Him. And that's what's going on in Job. You know what happens in Job, right? What happened in Job was, in the end, Job started blaming God. All right. So the next relationship is under God. Okay. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of work, so that no one may boast. Okay? Job 29, 14. The entire, the entire chapter of Job 29 outlines the righteousness of Job. Job boasts about his righteousness in Job 29. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban in Job 29, 14. What was Job trying to say? How was he righteous before God? What does the text say? He has got his own righteousness that clothes him. It is not the righteousness of God, but his own righteousness. How did he set about to prove this? This is what happens. In the center of Job's life is good works and morals, good morals. All the work, the plants, the goals, church, God, and others revolve around the goodness of somebody. This being under God. This is what Job did. You have time, go back to Job 29 and read what he says. In terms of morality, he boasts about his morality, his sexual purity, his generosity, and how he helped the poor, his benevolence, uh, how he gave, his truthfulness. Instead, in fact, he abstained from lust, from greed, from envy, from deceit, from vengeance, from violence. All of this Job did. That's why he was blameless. And because all of these are righteous, I can clothe myself in righteousness. I'll be accepted by God. What is this? This is sheer salvation by works. Self-righteousness. Okay. Um, there's a problem. If you read the entire chapter of Job 29, nothing in the list of Job mentions faith in God or trust in Him. Are you following? There's already 29 chapters removed from chapter 1 and chapter 2. He talks about all the good deeds that he has done and the bad deeds that he did not do. But he never talks about any relationship he's got with God. He doesn't talk about trust in God. He talks about the goodness that he has done. It's not worthy to suffer. Yeah. Oh, we will go to that. We will go to that. And that's a verse that has been misunderstood. Okay. Uh, this is my favorite illustration. If Terry were here, George Knight says, I had three academic degrees in Adventist theology, but put a note to my conference president resigning from the ministry. Fourteen years after I had become an Adventist, I became a Christian. What did George Knight say? He became a professor. He became a teacher. He became a pastor. But what was his goal as a pastor? His goal as a pastor was to be the first perfect Seventh-day Adventist. 
to be vegetarian, to follow all the rules. Because you say, the moment I follow all the rules, Jesus will come back. So when he became a pastor, he tried to make all of his churches perfect. You know what happens when you do that, right? You become very frustrated. And when he became honest with himself, he couldn't, he couldn't take it anymore. He turned in his ministerial credentials and he resigned from the ministry. And God was able to pull him back. Uh, that's why if you were there when we invited George Knight to spend the weekend with us, he wrote a book entitled, I Used to Be Perfect. Why did he say I used to be perfect? Because I used, I used to think I'd be saved by salvation. Uh, this is a recent, a recent camp meeting done in Soquel in California. It's available in YouTube. Look for George Knight. He, he preached about I used to be perfect. And he, he lambasts the way we understand salvation, mostly as Seventh-day Adventists. You think that we are saved by being perfect, and that's the, the problem in the church. And here's the problem. Most self-righteous people are hypocrites. You know why? Because they're only good outside, but inside they're like whitewashed tombs. They're really rotting inside. What did Billy Sunday say? Hypocrites in the church, don't hunt through the church for a hypocrite. Go home and look at the mirror. Hypocrites, yes. See that you make the number one less. Okay? Because all of us are hypocrites. This is amazing what C.S. Lewis says. Prostitutes are in no danger of finding their present life so satisfactory that they cannot turn to God. The proud, the avaricious, the self-righteous are in that danger. Did you see what C.S. Lewis is saying? Prostitutes who have wasted their life, the lowest in human existence that you can be in, particularly as a woman, are so in despair that they naturally turn to God. The fact that they're in so bad a condition, there's a better possibility for them to turn to God rather than the proud, the avaricious who never express their need of God. This is amazing. This is why a cold, self-righteous prig who goes regularly to church may be far nearer to hell than a prostitute. But of course, it is better to be neither. What is C.S. Lewis trying to say? You know, if you're proud and you're self-righteous, you're closer to hell than, than a prostitute because a prostitute would likely repent and try to look for a, for a good life. Okay? So there's a big problem. If you, buy, you want to be a moralist, there's a very, very big danger. So how, how do we describe this? Based on the flow chart, you worship God because He pays you. Okay? And if God doesn't, God doesn't bless you, what will you say? Oh, He's just taking vengeance on me. That's the meaning of what we say under God. Right? From the standpoint of man, oh, I worship him because I earned it. I, I am blessed because I earned it. And then if he doesn't bless you, oh, you did not get healed because you did not believe. If you only believe, you will be healed. Have you, have, you, have you heard that? You know, it's amazing. If you visit, uh, just an example, you have a church member who is so sick in the deathbed. Pastor visits the church member along with the elders. They prayed so that this member will get healed and the member dies. Then one of the elders will say, you know why he died? Because you did not believe. <laughs> that's bad. That's so bad. That's so heartless. But that's what's going on in this particular category. Okay? Then the next category is what we call over God. Uh, we covered this before. We look at the community churches prompt, promoted the vision of the church that is big, programmatic, and comprehensive. A big box with programs for people at every level of spiritual maturity. How many of you have been to We Look Creek Church? We Look Creek Church is like a, it's like a concert hall. It's just like the biggest the Rosemont Horizon. Uh, and Bill Hyvels and the organizer are saying, we made the mistake. We, we focus on the programs more than we focus on the disciplines that every member should have. Okay? What did they say? In Job 1.5, he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For God said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Job was a very rich man. And because he had a very rich man, he gave a lot of money to his kids. He had 10 kids. And the 10 kids were party animals. They had parties every day. And what does Job do every day while they party? He offers sacrifices. Why does he offer a sacrifice? Because if he doesn't offer a sacrifice, what does it say? It may be that they have sinned and they curse God. If they curse God, what will happen to them? They will die and they will be cursed. So if I offer 
an uh, offering, I will appease God and He will not curse. Right? Isn't this still a retributive principle? Why? Because Job is saying, if I offer sacrifice and do something to please God, He will not curse my kids. How does that happen in the application that we have today? What becomes the center of over God? Forms becomes the center of over God. We put forms in the center of things. And this is what the way looking people say. We made a mistake. We should have taught people how to read their Bible between services, how to do spiritual practices, prayer, Bible study, and relationships. Why? Because those people who are lovers of pleasure rather than the lovers of God have the appearance of godliness, but what? They deny the power of God. So there is an appearance externally of godliness, but inside there is no power. What did Jesus say? These people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. I will go back to the... Did, did, Job, did Job honor God with his lips? Yes, he did. Right? He did not sin. He did not sin. He did not curse God. He did not accuse God. He did not sin with his lips. The big question is, did Job sin with his heart? We'll find out in a little while that he did sin with his heart. Okay? So be very careful. Guard against what I call ecclesiolatry and technolatry. What, that, what does it mean? That's a coined word. Ecclesiology comes from the word ecclesia, which is church. Latry is like idolatry, worshiping the church, or technolatry, worshiping technology. What does this mean? You know, we, uh, we're into this new age of technology, and I've worked with Pastor Ariola in North America and the Asia Pacific, uh, training pastors and churches for church growth. And you cannot avoid the internet, you cannot avoid Twitter, you cannot avoid Facebook. Everybody should use technology, okay? But the problem is, People get so enamored with technology, they begin worshiping technology. Uh, and then some people say, oh, look at this. We got live streaming. We got an excellent sound system. We got an excellent worship team. Because this is so great, our church is so great. What has happened? They begin worshiping the church. The problem is when you become form, this place is God. What happens to the form? The form becomes an idol. Uh, so, you got to guard against ecclesiology and technology. There's one story you can probably share with your class. It's the art of worship. The art of worship uh, was written by Matt Redman. Uh, one church in England was top notch when it comes to soundboards and technology, and the band was one of the best worship team in the whole world. They were excellent musicians. One day, Paul Terebachi, the pastor of the church, said, there is something wrong. There is something missing. We got very professional music. We got all the lights. We got all the sounds. We got all the technology. But the spirit is not here. So you know what they ended up doing? He suspended everything that's been done in the church. There was no music. There were no instruments. He said, you come to church and we will pray. We will worship God from our hearts. And after several weeks, Matt Redman came back after he was fired. Okay. He came back with the song. You know the song, right? What's the song? The heart of worship. We sing that still today. It touches the hearts, the, the hearts of churches. Why does it, how does it go in the, the refrain? It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things that I made it. I thought it was about us and about me and about the church. No, it's, about, it's not about me. It's about you. So let's summarize it in terms of the, the flow chart. God blesses. There's idolatry. I worship Him because really, even if God blesses me, He's not worthy of worship. What's worthy of worship? The things that He gives me is worthy of worship. The technology that I have, even the church that the things, it is not Himself that is being blessed. Now, if He doesn't bless me, oh, He does not bless me because I haven't done my homework. He's a vindictive God. And then from the standpoint of man, even if God blesses me, I really don't care. I care more for my idols than I care for Him. Uh, we were having our small group Bible study last night, and I said, there's a common expression among church members. They say, I really have no time. Have you heard that? Hey, do you find time to read your Bible? you find time to pray every day? 
I really have no time. You have time to go to church and fellowship with her. I really have no time. When you say, I really have no time, what are you trying to say? You're not important for me to commit time to you. And if God is not that important to you, is he still a God? He's no longer your God. But when it comes to your own interest, you can make time. Okay? People can go playing golf. People can go watch TV and do their in thing rather than follow what God has desired for them. And when that happens, whatever is desirable to you becomes an idol. Okay, that's you're guilty of idolatry, and in effect, you have disbelieved and mistrusted God. Okay. The next is what we call for God. I already told you about this. Phil Fisher um, started Veggie Tales. That that became Veggie Tales became the the number one uh, uh, TV and video outreach of Christians. He thought that Phil Fisher was, was the next Walt Disney. But what happened? VeggieTales went into bankruptcy. Phil Fisher was, uh, lost everything. And he said, the lesson that I learned is that God told me VeggieTales was getting more important than him. And God said, I don't want your VeggieTales, Phil. I want you instead of your dream for me. Job 1, 9 to 10. Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? So what happens? What becomes the center of Christian activism? I call it mission becomes the center of Christian activism. What does that mean? If you have an objective outreach, if people do outreach, center it on outreach. How many times have you heard this? The chief aim of the church is for evangelism. Have you heard that? If you don't go outreach and you don't evangelize, you have not fulfilled the chief aim of the church. That's why mission becomes the center. You go into activism. There's only one problem. Because mission can turn into an idol itself. And Tim LaHaye is saying, the best way to carry out the mission that Christ gave to his church is not to focus on the mission, but to focus on him. How many of you have uh, thought that uh, pastors are more spiritual than the rest of the members of the church? A lot of people think that, right? When you listen to some, oh, I, I, I'm revived now. I'm going to come back to God. In fact, I want to go to the ministry. <laughs> they think he's spiritual. There's one problem. Have you heard this? Everybody has a vocation. What is a vocation? That's your work. You know where vocation comes from? From the Latin word what? Vocare. What's vocare? Voca. It's a voice. Literal translation, it's a call. Vocation is nothing more than your calling. You have been called to be an engineer. You have been called to be a surgeon. You have been called to be a scientist. You have, you have been called to be a computer programmer. You have been called to be a technician. Can you serve God in your own field of endeavor? That's the point. A pastor is no more called to his pastorship than an engineer, okay? Or then an architect is called to his profession because that's the call of God. I wish I can develop this some more. But the bottom line is the calling of God comes in every line of work men can be in. Can you glorify God in your work? Yes, you can. That's basically what we're trying to say. And the best way to carry out the mission that Christ gave to you is not to concentrate on the mission, but to concentrate on Jesus Christ. Why? Because if you concentrate... On Jesus Christ, even if you go to your work and your office, the rest of the day will be an exercise of glorifying Him. Okay? Uh, remember when the shepherds were called, that was our devotion last night. After they saw the baby Jesus and Mary treasured everything in her heart, according to the Bible, they went home glorifying and praising God. You realize that if you encounter Jesus, the rest of your activities will be centered on glorifying and praising God. So I, we were just studying this last night. If you start the day without praying and committing yourself with God and committing yourself in the day to God, more than likely you will not praise Him. But if you start the day with Jesus Christ, your day will be a life of worship. And the day, whether you're an architect, whether you're a scientist, whether you're in the medical profession, it doesn't matter. If you start it with God, then you will 
follow his leading for you. God doesn't want our works. He wants us and then wants us to work together with us. You follow this? He doesn't really want our works. Can God accomplish things without us? Yes, he can. He doesn't need us. But what does he want to do? He wants us. He's asking, can I have you? Because even if I can do it all by myself, I want to do it with you. And if I do it with you, that's the purpose why I came in the first place. But let's go to the... Let's go to the answer. Okay, if God does not bless, He is an uncaring God. And when you worship Him, He becomes a distant God if God does not bless you. Okay, this is missions. Okay, you do missions. If you go up there again, you do missions in order for God to pay you. Remember that story? There was this missionary coming back to America. And during the time, there were no airplanes yet. They, so they rode rode the boat coming back to America. And when they, when they started docking, I think in New York, the missionaries were there. It turns out that the President of the United States was in the boat himself. And what happened was, <laughs> what happened? There was like the red carpet was rolled, there was the limo, and everybody was doing fanfare for the President of the United States. And then the man says, for years, we have labored in Africa to be missionaries for God. And we didn't hear a single instrument played for us in our return. And here comes the president and gets all the accolades. The wife goes to the, to the husband and says, you got to settle this with God. <laughs> you cannot go home with you thinking like this. And according to the illustration, this man went and prayed to God. And God gave him an answer. What was the answer of God? You are not home yet. In other words, you think your home is in New York? Your home is not in New York. Your home is in heaven. That's a nice story, but I have a problem with the story. <laughs> Are you saying you just became a missionary so you can get to heaven? That's a problem. The problem is if you become a missionary to get something from God, you fell into the trap. But if you worship God for the sake of Him, then it really doesn't matter. Okay? Uh, same old soup at the other side. Then let's go to the, the eventual solution. The solution is with God. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Let's process this in the book of Job. You know, that's Mary. He was always with Jesus in the Gospels. He was always at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus. At the cross, he was there. At the resurrection morning, Mary was there. She was always with Jesus. She understood what the Gospel was about. The Gospel is about we being with God. Okay, Job 1, 1 says, His name was Job, and that name was, he was blameless and upright. Okay? Then I had my class read this this morning. There was another man who was blameless in the Old Testament. His name was Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God. What's the difference between Job and Noah? Look at the two verses. Both of them are blameless, but one of them walked with God. What's the meaning of walking with God? Walking with God means having a relationship with God. Did, did Job uh, do what was right? Yes, he was blameless, but did he walk with God? We will prove that Job was there just for what he can get from God rather than having a relationship with God. So, let's go. Job 1.21. Uh, Larry, the, your question is about to be answered. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All of Job's possessions are gone. All of your kids died. And what did Job say? The Lord gave and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow, look at the, the faith of this man. You don't understand. There's something wrong with this. Why? Because... Job talks about God. He does not talk to God. Are you following? He could have said, you, Lord, you give and you take away and I will still bless you. Instead of saying that, he describes God. And that's a problem sometimes. When you have no relationship with God, you can talk about God, God's head knowledge, but no relationship with Him. Secondly, 
Job 1.22 says, And all this Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. He did not charge God with wrong. And in Job 2.10, when he started having boils, it says, And all this Job did not sin with his lips. I want you to read that very carefully. and We processed it in our class this morning. The problem with Job was, he did not accuse God. Because he was upright, he was blameless. Externally, he didn't want people to look at him, and he was actually against God. And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. That's my question. If Job did not sin with his lips, could have he sinned someplace else? Yes, where did he sin? He sinned in his heart. Job will not speak openly what he feels in his heart towards God. He's trying to put up a front that says, I'm a goody two-shoes, I respect God, I must be a respectable man. But deep in his heart, he really questioned God. Okay? Now here's the uh, question of uh, Larry. And if you were here during my last uh, preview, I clarify that. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. He also shall be my salvation. That's the translation of the New King James Version. If you look at the other translation, and we've already gone through this exercise, particularly the New Living Translation, this is the way it should read. The right translation is, God might kill me because I'm about to die. I'm, I'm full of sores. But I have no other hope. I am going to argue my case with him. But this is what will save me. I am not godless. What did Job say? Even if I die because of what God is trying to do, I will not stop defending myself. Because I am not godless. I am good. And because of my goodness, I will justify myself before God. Are you following? So Larry, the way we've understood, and the way I understood this text for the longest time is wrong. This is not a statement of faith. This is a statement of arrogance. An arrogant statement that say, I am not guilty, I can defend my God, I defend my goodness before God, and even if he kills me, I will keep on defending myself. But the problem with the situation of Job, the why, he does not know why he is suffering. Okay, don't jump there yet because we're going to go there. I just want to make sure that we understand the right translation of this verse. This is not translated properly. But if you read all the translation and you read it in context, Job is basically saying, hey, because God is punishing me, I'm about to die with all this source. I'm really sick. I'm about to die. In fact, I want to die. But I will not stop defending myself because only by defending myself can I be guiltless before God. Okay? So it's not a statement of faith. It's a statement, an arrogant statement of self-righteousness. All right. Why did I say this? In Job 42 and 8, this is what happens when God finally answers Job. What did, Job, what did God say? Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Correct him? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you might be in the right? What was God telling Job? You are rebuking me. You are condemning me. You're saying you're right and I am wrong. Do you realize this? Who is Job talking to? He's talking to God and he's condemning God. What did God say in the end? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? In other words, in order for you to prove that you're really guiltless, you will have to condemn me and say that I am wrong. That's so audacious, okay? Yeah, because after chapter 38, God mm. said, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? So after that time, Job changed his mind understanding now who he is. All right. Okay, so the question is, before God talked to him, how did Job feel? Was he trusting in God or was he trusting in his own righteousness? Are you looking at me like that idiot? You had a question? Yeah, well, it's okay. important. Okay, so this is the point. We have pictured Job in a very different light. The problem is God allowed Job to go through this exercise so he can understand what it means to glorify him. Right? So, this is what it's saying. In the end, he find, found fault with God. In fact, he wanted to prove God wrong as long as he's in the right. That's so bad. He's debating with God. He doesn't want to prove that God is wrong and he is right. Yeah, the question was, uh, can we say that he was bragging when he identified himself that I was doing this, I was doing this, uh -huh. I was feeding, I was uh -huh. taking care of it. Was that like a bragging? What was... Uh, what do you think is it? When, when he started saying... I fed the poor, I did all of this, I abstained from lust, from good, all of this, and I have a robe of righteousness, and that will make me acceptable before God. What do you call that? If you don't call that self-righteousness, I don't know what you want to call it. 
But people, they want to whitewash Job. They, because they want to, there's a preconceived idea that Job was good. Okay? Good is blameless, but he was not good in terms of relationship with God. How good were the Pharisees? The Pharisees were the best religious observers during them. There was only one problem. Their religion was an external religion. It was not a heart religion. So deep in the heart of Job, he was righteous in himself. Deep in the heart of God, God is telling Job, you have no righteousness. I alone have righteousness, and if not for my grace, you will not even be alive. That's what he's trying to say. Okay? Yeah. Okay. In the case of uh, Dark Knight, he claims he used to be perfect. Okay. Because he apparently believed that uh, in the statement of Jesus that be therefore perfect. Sure. Perfect. You got to understand. We're stand yes. He failed in his perfect. Yes, and, and, and yeah, in answer to your question, Benji, remember we're dealing with the Old Testament here. Jesus has not yet come. So we got to study it in the context. Remember what was the context? It's the triangle. God's justice, Job's righteousness, and the retribution principle, right? You got to remember yeah. this, okay? Yeah. The fact that you know this triangulation is, was Job perfect? No, he was not perfect. In fact, he says he had sins from his youth. You read from the, if he failed in his youth. But in this particular case, he said, I have no reason to suffer because I am a blameless man. He did not say he was perfect. He said, I am a blameless man, and based on the fact that I am blameless, I should not suffer because the retribution principle says I should prosper. Right? And what happens? What did the three friends of Job say? You got a problem, Job. You are suffering because you are not blameless. You did something wrong. And Job keeps on saying, no, I didn't do anything wrong. It is God that doesn't know what he's doing. Because if God follows the retribution principle, I will prosper, I will not suffer. Are you following the triangle right there? So he never claimed perfection. He was just claiming, God, you're not just because you're not applying the retribution principle in my life. I haven't done anything wrong, and yet I'm suffering. I did not say I am blameless. It is God's description of who the job is. What was the question again about the blaming? Did not say I am blameless. God is describing him to be blameless. It is not him himself that says he is. Oh, he did. I just, I just read it in Job 29. He listed all of this. That I have done this. I haven't done anything wrong. I clothed myself with my righteousness. That's what he said. That, that's blamelessness. And then the point is, and I think the point of Benji is, you are not saved by being blameless. Being blameless. Can an atheist be blameless? Yes, he can, right? Uh, that uh, the atheist can obey all the laws of the land, can be even a philanthropist and give all the money he's got to the poor and those who are needy and not believe in God. It's possible. But you are not saved by blamelessness. You are not saved by any righteousness that you own. You are only saved by the righteousness of Jesus where the only way you can be perfect. Okay? And that's the problem. Uh, Job was basically saying, hey, Lord, I did not violate anything that you asked me to do. Why in the world am I suffering? The retribution principle says I should prosper. And yet I am suffering. Okay? So remember what we said? Job's friend pointed their finger at whom? Who did they point their finger at? They pointed their finger at Job. About Job, he pointed this finger at whom? Pointed this finger at God. And you look at the worst sin. The worst sin is Job blaming God while his friends were blaming him. And the retribution principle. That's why Job is a very warped view of God. And God was on... A crusade to change the mind of Job. And if it takes him to give him a really hard time for him to truly worship him, he's worth it. Because remember what God say? You can touch his body, but do not take away his life. Because out of this, I want to teach him a lesson. He will understand what it means to worship me in the end. Okay? Yes. If you give me more slides, I will explain to you how the retribution principle will work, okay? It becomes valid in the life of Jesus Christ, okay? Yeah, but, but yes, of, uh, yes, 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 we, we'll, we'll go there. But I got another 20 slides and that will answer your question, all right? 
This desiring God, Christian hedonism. What's the meaning of Christian hedonism? Christian hedonism means finding pleasure in God. You know what? The, if you got to a church bulletin, what is the mission statement of Philem Church? Worshiping God by enjoying Him forever. The way to worship God is to enjoy God. If you delight in God, if you're, if you're, if you are searching and pursuing God rather than pursuing what He gives you, that's what it means to be worshiping. Where is that base? What is the text in the Bible? You guys know this. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. The only way for the desires of your heart to be with you is to, for you to first find delight in the Lord. What does that mean? Don't delight in what the world gives you, but delight in God first. And then He will give you the desires of your heart. It would be a shame if during this Christmas season, I can make Ed an example. Ed gives gifts to his kids. And his kid starts loving the gift so much, they forget about you, right? Ed, you know what happens? That becomes heartbreaking, right? But what happens, Ed, when the kids, instead of just looking at the toys that you gave them, hugs you and loves you, you will give, you, you will give them more, right? That's the problem with, with, our, with our concept of happiness. We concentrate on the happiness that we can pursue, and it is, very, it is very limited. But what does the Bible say? You pursue God. When you pursue God and you get God, you get everything with Him. Uh, what well, was my illustration? If you were given a choice, uh, a, a check for $100,000 right now, or adoption papers from Bill Gates, what will you choose? Yeah, why will you do that? Because it's crazy to get $100,000. You'll blow it away in about a year, right? The way we, we spend here. But if you have the adoption papers of Bill Gates, everything that Bill Gates has goes to you. The same most true with what... Oh, yes. Yeah, so but this is just a parable, okay? Yeah, yeah let's take the details. All we're trying to say here is the Bible is saying in order for you to really enjoy and find happiness in your desires, you don't look for the desires. Delight in God. Find the pursuit of God. And when you have God, all the desires of your heart will be given. In fact, why is the Sabbath very important? I'd like to put this in. The only other verse that comes close to Psalm 37 verse 4 is this text in 58, 13. Call the Sabbath the delight and holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or taking highly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. One of the best ways to take delight in the Lord is to enjoy the Sabbath day with Him. I cannot overemphasize this, okay? And if you only learn to preach the gospel and the Sabbath as Adventists in terms of this, people will be more attracted to our gospel rather than, well, yeah, Adventists, because I keep the right day of the week. Big deal. So the Muslims keep Friday. This is the, the Catholics keep Sunday and the other Protestants you keep Saturday. You think what's going to get you to heaven is keeping the right day? Some people believe that. <laughs> No, what gets you to heaven is that you've delighted in God and you wanted to be with God forever. Is it possible for you to keep the seven-day Sabbath and hate what the Sabbath does, right? I got to keep the Sabbath, okay? I want to do anything during sunset. <laughs> okay, you play with the sun. That's really bad, okay? All right, we go to Christmas now. Behold, the virgins are conceived and bear a son. They shall call his name what? Emmanuel. What's the meaning of Emmanuel. God is with us. We are not under God. We are not for God. We get, don't think gets from God. We are with God. But yeah, okay. I know. I have no time. We will probably discuss this time. They're saying Jesus was more likely born in September. Okay. How do you do that? I'll, I'll just give you a very brief, because I have no time to discuss this. You date the birth of Jesus Christ based on the conception of John the Baptist. Because the father of John the Baptist came from a priestly order. And they had a rotation 24 times in a year. And you can time exactly when the angel approached Zacharias and when Elizabeth started conceiving. And when, remember, Mary visited Elizabeth? And when Mary visited Elizabeth, who was first conceived? John was first conceived. He was six months older than... Jesus Christ. And they're saying based on the reckoning, Mary conceived John in about February. Okay? And you go six months from there, it will be about September when Jesus was born. Okay? Next time. 
when I preview the lesson, I'll give you all the details for that. But the, the real birth of Christ was more than likely in September. Some people even say it was September 11. Okay. But it was, it was, I was in September. Okay, it doesn't matter. Anyways, here's the, here's, the, here's the question. Here's the question. Was he always perfect? What is the gospel? The essence of the gospel is 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What does that mean? Basically, in the gospel, you find the infinite sacrifice of Jesus because in Jesus Christ, he pays the penalty of your sin. The eternal penalty of sin is paid by Jesus Christ. Because he paid it, you don't have to pay it anymore. Okay? But there are two parts of the gift of the gospel. The second part is perfect righteousness. What does that mean? When God looks at me, who does he see? He doesn't see me. He sees the perfection of Jesus Christ. So in, in, the, in the face of God, before God, it is as if I haven't committed any sin. And I can go directly to heaven. I am really sinless. I am perfect in Jesus Christ because God sees Jesus Christ in me. If the devil asks, hey, has he paid for his sins? What will Jesus say? I shed my blood for him. Was that enough? Yes, it's more than enough to save the entire world. In fact, the entire universe because that's the blood of the Son of God. Therefore, in the gospel, I have paid for my sin. And what else? I have perfect righteousness before God. So how does this relate to Job? How can Job alone be perfect? Through the sacrificial system, right? How old was Job when he died? Now, he said he lived for another 140 years. According to most commentators, more than likely when he suffered, he was about 50 years old. So more than likely, Job died at a ripe old age of 180, 190 years old. I don't know about the second wife. Okay? <laughs> it's, not it's, not, it's not stated there. The only question I have is, who among the, the people in the Old Testament lived to be that, you know, that old? It's what, what we call the patriarchs, right? The patriarchs, 140, 150, Abraham, those guys. So more than likely, more than likely, Job was a patriarch. Did the patriarch know the sacrificial system? Yes, because Abraham... Yes, in, in other words, why was the sacrificial system introduced? Because that's the way men will be saved. How was it introduced? From Adam and Eve, it was passed down to generation in the patriarch's path. So did Job understand what it means to give a sacrifice? Yes, he did. The only problem when we started the book of Job, he gave a sacrifice. By giving the sacrifice, he thought he can appease God. It was something he did for God. He finally understood in the end, the sacrifice is not for him to do something for God, but it is God's gift for him to be forgiven in Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what it's trying to say. Perfect righteousness, infinite. So here's the... Here's the triangulation, God's justice, Job's righteousness, and the retribution principles. Is the answer, Benji, to your question. This is what happened in the book of Job. In God's wisdom, in Jesus Christ, mercy and justice kiss. Okay? Uh, Christ's righteousness is imputed in Job through the sacrifice. Because who died and did all the righteousness. It wasn't Job, it was Jesus Christ. And through what Jesus did, what done and died, Christ's righteousness, makes Job perfect in the sight of God. Now, does the retribution principle follow now? Yes, it works. Because if you are perfectly righteous, you will have eternal life. That's what the retribution principle says. Can you be perfectly righteous? Yes, only by faith in Jesus Christ. Because in Jesus Christ, you have perfect righteousness. Okay. Do you prosper in Jesus Christ? What did Jesus say? My kingdom is not of this world. I do not fight. And the award, the reward that I give you is not what you get from this world. The reward is for you to be with me. All right? So the retribution principle works only in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Job did not see Jesus Christ because he lived so long, long, uh, so many millennia before Jesus Christ came. But did he understand the sacrificial system? He did. And that the sacrificial system prefigured what Christ was about to do. What happened at the, at the cross? When we talk about righteousness, we use the word imputed, right? Mm -hmm. When we, we talk about the sin of Adam, we use Im imparted. No, it's also imputed. What do we use imparted? Imparted is during holy living. That's sanctification. Holy living is imparted. When, when it, it is imparted in you, it becomes part of you. Okay? When you get sanctified, Larry, it is your own life that's sanctified. When you get justified and righteousness is imputed 
on you. It is not your righteousness. It is the righteousness of Jesus only by faith. That's the difference. Imparted righteousness is what happens in me. Imputed righteousness is what happened outside of me in Jesus Christ that has been given to my account. And that's a problem with Adventism. They confuse imparted righteousness and imputed righteousness. I want to go to the technicalities. All, what, all that I'm trying to say is, where was the perfection of Job? The perfection of Job was in the forgiveness God gave him through the sacrificial system. So I know well, the righteousness is imputed. Uh -huh. But what I'm talking about, I think Job's night is also the one that the sin of Adam is not imputed. It is imparted. It's both imparted and imputed imparted in the sense that all men are created with the propensity to sin okay but what what cons what makes you a sinner larry what makes me a sinner because it's part of Adam. let me let me rephrase my question am i a sinner because i do something wrong or something bad because leah why are we sinners cleo oh there you go okay there you go here's the point that's why David was able to say in Psalms, I was shaped in iniquity in, my, in sin did my mother conceive me. I, he was a sinner even during conception. He hasn't done anything wrong. He was a sinner. Why? Because if you read Romans 5, 12 to 21, we are sinners because Adam sinned. We came from a sinner. And because, well, it's genetic in the sense of propensity to sin. But that's not imputation. That's impartation. Impartation is having the propensity, the tendency. But in terms of imputation, because you came from Adam who was a sinner before God, how do you stand? You stand condemned. When did that condemnation begin? At the moment of conception. You are not condemned because you've done something wrong. That's, that's what we call imputation. It is imputed because Adam sinned. And how are you saved? How are you saved? You are saved because Jesus died for you and saved you. And what Christ did, the second Adam, is imputed to you. If you are born into Adam's family, you will be condemned. How are you saved alone? You must be born again into the family of Jesus Christ by imputation. That's why come, come the last days when you approach the, the heavenly throne of judgment, you will not... Pride yourself in saying, hey, I can go to heaven because of any righteousness that I have. I am only accepted because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If Satan says, oh, no, he came from Adam, he's the seed. No, he's no longer, Abra he's no longer Adam's seed. He is the seed of Abraham in Jesus Christ. In other words, he's been born again. He's in the family of God. The righteousness of Christ has been imputed in him. Okay? So, the impartation takes over because when you accept God, you will begin to do good works. Okay, Are you saved by your good works? we got to go to this exercise again. You are not saved by your good works. You are saved unto good works. You are not saved through good works. You are saved unto good works. What, 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 how, does, how does John Stott put it? How can you say you are saved and not hate what Jesus hated? Are you following me? If you really care and trust Jesus Christ and you trust Him for your salvation, will you begin to hate what Jesus hated and love what Jesus loved? Yes. If you hate what Jesus hated and love what Jesus loved, what will you do to your life? You will shape your life after Him. Okay, here's the point. Uh, so, Christ's righteousness imputed me. I'll give you an illustration. Uh, Ramsey, Stacy's husband, came to me last night and said, You know, Uncle Bing, uh, I was wondering, I attended Bolingbrook Church, and I saw your son. He was playing the guitar and leading out in worship. And all of a sudden, I started thinking, you know, I've seen this guy before. I, his face is so familiar. I, although it was the first time he saw my son. He's, he, 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 I know him. He, he just, he, I know him. Turns out, he finally dawned on me. Stacy goes, she realized that's the son of Uncle Bing. <laughs> okay. Why does he look like me? Because... He's my son. That's impartation. Every day you grow in God and you become more like Christ from glory to glory. That's impartation. Okay. When you get to heaven, are you saved because of what happened to your life? No. When you get to heaven, you are still saved by Jesus Christ. That's the problem with a lot of Adventism. Because they're growing in their imparted righteousness. They think that their imparted righteousness will take them to heaven. And by the time they get to heaven, they go there on their own accomplishments not because of Jesus Christ 
And that's why. That's the point. That's the point. But people don't realize that. That's why a lot of people rejected righteousness by faith in 1888. We've got to go back to that again. The gospel is righteousness by faith. It's righteousness by imputation, but not by impartation. And we'll go to that in the end. Because really, the way you have imparted righteousness is not to try your level best to be good, but to allow God to do His good work in you, okay, by submitting to Him. Uh, show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. Surely... His salvation is near to those who fear Him, that glory may dwell in your land. Mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. That's, that's where I saw the, what I gave you, righteousness and peace, they kissed together, okay? I have heard you of you by the hearing of my ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Did Job repent? Why did he repent? That is what Pastor Joe would say. You know, repentance in for sin. I say, no. Uh, Job did not sin, but he still he repent. He repent because one, he's, 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 uh, he's proud of being blameless. All right, okay. How, how sure are you that Job didn't sin? He, he, he repent. He is blameless, but did he sin? But he did not repent. He did not, his repentance is not... For sin, his repentance is being stubborn. Okay, he did not repent for moral guilt, but he repented of his relational mistrust. Follow me carefully. When Jesus was here, he revolutionized the understanding of disobedience. He said, "You have heard it said, you should not kill." What right? did Jesus say? You don't have to kill somebody to be a murderer. All you need to do is hate him in your heart. You don't have to commit adultery to violate the seventh commandment. All you need to do is lust after a woman in your heart, in your heart. So what Jesus is saying, what is important to me is your heart. And really the worst sin that can happen is the thing that happens in your heart. Because you hypocrites, he said, you whitewashed tombs, you brood of vipers. You are so good, you follow all the religious regulations, but deep in your heart you don't care about me. That's a worst sin. And the prodigal son. That's why what did C.S. Lewis say? The proud and avaricious, the self-righteous are in danger of going to hell. <laughs> More danger than the prostitutes who has accepted Jesus Christ. Because general understanding, when you repent, there is something sin. Yes. That's yes. And I hope when the lesson ends, Larry, we shall have learned that sin is not a matter of doing bad or doing good. Sin is mistrusting God. And yeah. that's the lesson in the book of Job. And God was trying to teach Job a very important lesson that really what matters in this life is not what you do or what you get from me, but if you trust me and you are with me. Okay? Um, I want thing more. So sin as defined by the book of Job is more profound oh, yes. than sin that is Yes, yes. And you, 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 you got the right words. If people will understand the book of Job the way you should understand it, it's a very profound concept of salvation and sin. In fact, in Romans 14, 23, what did Paul say? That which is not of faith is sin. How did he define sin? Sin is not the violation of the law. If you do, if you do something out of faith and out of mistrust, that is sin. Is it possible to do something good and still sin? We'll look at that in a little while. Uh, you've heard, you have heard people who would be happy in heaven if Christ were not there will not be there. The gospel is not the way to get people to heaven. It is a way to get people to God. Let me go back to that. The gospel is not about getting to heaven. Always hear that on the pulpit. We want to be in heaven with you. We're so thankful that we'll make it possible for us to go to heaven. That's not the goal of the gospel. The goal of the gospel is to get you to God. And God will take you to heaven. Uh, you got to munch on that for us. The gospel is not a way to get to people to heaven. It's a way to get people to God. That, that is the gospel of the kingdom. There's only one gospel. There's only one gospel. Yep. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. Why? Because that's what Benji is saying. The book of Job is so profound. If you begin to understand it, God allowed Job to suffer so much because he cared so much for Job. So Job can understand what it means to be related to him and to worship him. Okay. What did Paul say? I count everything as loss 
because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. What does that mean? It means if there was one martyr, if there was one apostle, if there was one Christian who followed God all the way, who suffered most, it was Apostle Paul. And yet he said, although I was stoned, I was shipwrecked, I was persecuted, I was thrown into prison, I count all of them as nothing, nada, zilts. What's the most important thing to me? Knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. That was the lesson God was trying to teach Job. So it's a, he's a God, it's a providing God. If you look at the, the flow chart, he is an all-wise God. He's a providing God worthy of my oh God, you worship. Went, you went back there. Uh, br bribing God or bribing me? How about Abraham? Did he, did he obey because God promised him so many blessings? No. In fact, Abraham sinned. No, but because I will, I will, I will. Then Abraham obeyed. Yeah, but I mean, when, when God came to him one day, Offer your son, your only son. What did he do? But that is not the part there. Then he say, no, no, don't, don't, no. don't say, but what will happen if Isaac dies? What will happen to all of his descendants? Lost. Yeah, answer me, Larry. If Isaac dies, and that's the only son that he has, to make it possible for him to have children as many as the sands of the earth, sands of the sea, and as many as the stars in heaven, will he still have descendants? But well, what did Abraham do? For him, it was more important to be related to God than to get his descendants. That's proof that says that my love for God transcends my expectation of the blessings from him. That was the lesson God was trying to teach Job. Because it's faith. Because faith is righteousness. Because he knows that God will always, uh, yeah. you know, you know, well, resurrect Isaac or he could give another. Yeah. Yeah, but he did not offer Isaac because. Yeah, but he did not. He did not, he did not offer Isaac just to know he's going to get something in return. He just basically followed God. How God will finish the story, he didn't know. He but he still followed God. Job didn't know what's going to happen, right? It could be that Job could have not been blessed by God. But what was important was he should learn to follow God and trust Him. I already quoted this, the total righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on the part, but as a free gift from God, it's a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. So this is divine bribery. We worship because God blesses, and we worship because we expect God to bless us in return. That is not the teaching in the book of Job. It is divine wisdom, okay? God blesses in Jesus. If you accept the blessing in Jesus, you will learn what it means to worship. If you reject Jesus Christ, you will learn to curse God. From a man's standpoint, do you worship? Yes. Worship is enabled. Remember, you do not create worship in your heart. God enables you to worship, and that's true worship. On the other hand, worship can be manufactured, hypocritical worship, and that is false worship. And God is trying to deliver Job from that. Uh, wait. I was here one time, you know, mm -hmm. and he said, how about paying tithe? You know, when you give tithe, there is a promise. Mm -hmm. And then the girl say, I remember, mm -hmm. and I am faithful in my tithe, tithe paying, and I'm still poor. Okay. I that here. I was just okay. So how do you react? How, how do you react? How do you react to that statement now? If somebody speaks in front of the church and tells you, oh boy, I already gave my tithe and my offering, I'm still poor. But there is, not, there is attached to that Malachi 3.10, yes. there is a promise. Okay, before we go that, let's, let's apply what we learned in Job. Is that right? Is that the way we should look at tithing? If you learn anything from Job, that's wrong. Because that's retributive principle. Okay. Oh, but Malachi 3.10 says, Prove me now if I will not pour out the blessing. Have you seen people who have given to God and they still became dirt poor? Yes, sometimes God allows that to happen so His name can be glorified. So what's what? I don't know if you listened to my prayer today. During the pastor prayer, were you there inside when I prayed? There's a lot of people who are sick, and I'm I'm sick of hearing this sickness. We go to prayer meeting. Oh, this guy is sick. That guy is sick, and we pray as if by praying people are gonna get healed. If you learn anything from the book of Job, 
it's not healing from the sickness that really counts. It's the assurance that God will be with you and will do the best thing for you, whether he wants to heal you or not heal you. You know what happens? That's enablement. Lord, enable us to trust you so that regardless of what happens, we will still believe and love you and worship you. Okay, this Matthew 7, 22, 23. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did not cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Imagine. Sky Jitan is saying this is one of the scariest, most terrifying statements in the Bible. Why? Because you can do all the good works and even do mighty works in God, and yet you will be doing sin. Why? Because the book of Job tells you that you can do all of this, and if you're just doing this through divine bribery, it is an abhorrent sin. And that's what we're trying to say. Right? So the Lord said to Eliphaz, Tell Manite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. I want to clarify this before we end our lesson. This is a mistranslation. It's got to be put in the right translation. If you read the text without looking at the footnotes, my anger burns against the friends of Job, for they have not spoken of me what is right, but my servant Job has. Did Job speak of God rightly? No. Yeah, it, and after he repented, all right? And that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So here's the point. The Hebrew word used here, the preposition used here is L. Okay? You gotta understand it in the context. It can be it can be translated of, it can be translated to, okay? And you got to understand the context in order to understand linguistically what will fit the context. So really, most of the good scholars who know the book of Job translate it not as of, but to. Not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job. Here's the bottom line. In the end, like Leo said, did Job repent? How did he repent? He finally spoke to God. He did not speak about God. He spoke to God and repented towards God. And what is God telling Eliphaz and the friends of Job? You know what? Unlike Job, you have remained silent. You have not repented and not talked to me. That's what God is trying to say. Job talked to me and repented, but you did not. So you know what? I'll ask Job to offer a sacrifice so God, I can forgive you of your sins. Are you following now? That makes a very big difference and that makes the translation consistent. Yeah, he was talking to Eliphaz. Yeah. So there's a third one. Uh, Eliphaz, he said, Eliphaz, and then you know, build that and so far, okay? You're two other friends. You three, you three, you remain quiet. Unlike Job, you did not repent and you did not talk to me. That's what it's trying to say. Uh, you can twist your head. You will not understand this unless you look at, it took a while for me to figure this out too, okay? But the translation linguistically must be spoken to, not spoken of. You got to understand that. I hope you shared it with your class. That's another misunderstanding in the book of Job. Let's about the land now. I will give them a heart to know me. Who will give the heart? God will. They will return to me with their whole heart. Readings from the week of prayer that we just did several weeks ago. On this side of heaven, perfection is always a growth process and no amount of our doing anything can get us there. Rather, we have to keep clinging to Jesus. I said, I want to improve on that. Don't cling to Jesus. Think of Christ clinging or holding on to you because if Christ holds on to you he will never let you go I think this is my last slide before we go there last night uh, we were sharing after after our small group Bible study and Daniela was saying sometimes I feel so guilty because God has been so good to me and I still do this to him and I look at Daniela and said where is God when you feel guilty when you do something wrong, where is God? Isn't there a temptation sometimes to think if you do something wrong, God leaves us? Let me repeat this. If you do something wrong and you're guilty, God is still there with you. And when you believe that, nothing can separate you from God. It's really cool. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, demons, present, future, powers, height, death, anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. 
the gospel is about God with us. Job is about God with us. Okay? How do I finish this? I'm going to finish this. You know, this is a uh, redundancy for Benji because I told this story in my Sabbath class. I'm going to repeat this for the benefit of those who are watching, for the benefit of you this afternoon. Uh, as I have already said, it's redundant for me to say that I have the prettiest granddaughter in the world. Okay, so, so Lily's the prettiest girl that you've ever seen. People stalk her in Facebook. She's just so pretty. The only problem with Lily is that Lily's two years old. And you know when the, when the baby child becomes two years old, what do we call two? Terrible two. So one day, Lily has this uh, nasty habit when she gets bored with the toy, she throws the toy on the floor. So we were playing one day before I went to work, and Lily started throwing toys on the floor. So I told Lily, Bebe, please pick them up. Looks at me, doesn't do anything. Bebe, pick them up. Looks at me, doesn't do anything. I said, you want pop-up from grandpa? You know what pop-up is, right? You want pop-up from grandpa? Didn't do anything. So, poof, I did the little pop-up there. Didn't do anything, started crying. And then she hits the floor on her tummy. And started having tantrums. And then I pop up her again. I get up and pick those toys. She gets up, gets the toy, and throws it. <laughs> and then I said, come here. I got her hand. And then I slapped the hand. After I slapped the hand, she looks at me. She's crying and goes, Grandpa, I'm sorry, Grandpa. I'm sorry, Grandpa. And she hugs my neck and says, I'm sorry, Grandpa. That's why I posted it in, in, I posted it in Facebook. The look that always melts my heart okay. <laughs> when you do that. What do you think I did when Lily did that to me? You know, sometimes I need to have several spankings before she can turn around and tell me, Grandpa, I'm sorry. Because when that happens, that relationship of being with its other becomes very precious. That's what happened in the book of Job. Job almost died. It's very painful. He suffered. But all God wanted to do was for Job to turn around and say, Oh God. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Now I know you. I will worship you from my heart. You picked it up from the book of Job, the quarterly has not been in vain. It's amazing. I learned a lot from just studying the book of Job. I did not understand Job the way I understand Job now for the longest time. But I opened my mind, opened my heart. Lord, I said, teach me what I can learn from the lesson quarterly. The gospel is right there in the center of Job. And the gospel is telling me God will do anything for us to learn to love him and trust in him. If he needs to hurt us, he's going to hurt us. But he loves us so much for us to distrust him because he wants us to be with him. I have you take that to your class. So therefore, yeah. uh, Satan was proving wrong. Oh, yeah. That's why he wasn't talking in the back anymore. <laughs> he, he couldn't talk anymore because uh, really, uh, really, uh, God was telling Satan, you don't know what you're talking about. Let me show you. Show and tell. You know, God knew at the end from the beginning. Here's what's going to happen to Job. He's got a dialogue with the friends and all of this is going to happen. I come up with the whirlwind. What did I prove? I am not a God of bribery. I am a God of grace. That's the lesson in the book of Job. The lesson in the book of Job is not to lift Job as a hero, but make Job a character that God had to cleanse through the fire so he can understand what it means to trust in God and understand his grace. Right? You teach us your class, be a very, very different way to look at Job and look at your Christian life. All right, let's bow our for prayer as we end. Your Father, what a study. Uh, you're only willing, the Spirit will lead us. And it's amazing that your grace, your wisdom, your salvation, your mercy is right there, dead smack in the center of the book of Job. Teach us, dear Father, not to follow you only externally, not to bribe you, but instead teach us to pursue you and find delight in you. And in so doing, dear Father, teach us that the desires of heart will be met, not by anything else in this world, but because of what you have done in Jesus Christ. And in the spirit of this Christmas Eve season, this day of Christmas Eve, may we learn to understand that the gospel really is summarized in God with us in Jesus Christ. Teach us to treasure that, 
so that we can cherish being with God every day and God being with us until he comes back and we can be with him until forever. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.